and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. Now it's time for Kit Corner, where we shine a spotlight on artists who've created products with the film and television industry in mind. Products designed by artists for artists. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Now, you're a professional makeup artist working in the film and television industry, and you've created a product called Skin Saver Barrier Lotion. Can you tell me a little about yourself and why you created Skin Saver? Yeah, well, Skin Saver was created primarily because I've had issues with actors having bad reactions to the other barrier lotions that were out there. I'm a primarily a, a makeup effects artist, so I deal with a lot of prosthetics and a lot of glues and a lot of heavy paints and a lot of alcohol paints. And we needed something that was not going to dry out the actor's skin while it was protecting. So I had a client whose name is Jordan Peele, who of course everyone knows about now, <laughs> and he was having reactions to the primary shield that we were using and an opportunity presented itself after a lecture that I was giving and I met a guy whose family owned a medical cosmetic industry based company and I met with him and I explained that I wanted to create something that could help Jordan but also my other actors and we came up with this barrier that is not only a protection but also very good for the skin and very healing so it protects and heals at the same time which ended up being a great combination for a lot of my situations with actors with damaged skin or just any kind of time we wanted to protect them so it's become a good thing to have in the kit yeah that makes sense what a great idea so what is it saving and protecting the skin from well, like I said, originally we wanted to protect it from all the glues and the paints and, and that sort of stuff, but it can protect against almost any chemical, but dirt, grime, anything in our industry from the glues to the paints. But one of the things I'm excited about too is that it also protects against pollution. So even if you're not using it on your actor as a protection underneath prosthetics or makeups, it can help us in everyday life because it actually stops the air pollution from coming into the body and potentially damaging the organs. So it works against a lot of different things. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you feel it's different to other skin barrier products? I think the main difference or what I was trying to achieve was to actually have it have a healing energy to it as well as a protection. So we created it with uh, really high-end vitamins and aloe and such. So it will seal in the good stuff and keep out the bad stuff. I think that's what makes it a little different is that it actually has healing properties as well. That's excellent. So I imagine with all the hand washing and hand sanitizing, a little bit yeah. of skin barrier on the hands would be, be pretty amazing. Yeah, that's uh, of course the other reason. It protects us as well as the actor. So anytime you have to continuously wash your hands or, or sterilize your hands or you're working with any kind of heavy chemicals, it's protecting us as well. And I think what people may or may not realize is that everything gets absorbed into the skin and then eventually ends up in our organs. And mm. as an effects person, I've had lots of really gnarly chemicals go into my liver and as a consequence have weakened my liver. So this is actually a way to also help prevent our organs from getting damaged because everything gets absorbed through the skin. And uh, then the added benefit of it being an antibacterial, I think also makes it different. I don't think any of the other ones, at least the ones I've seen, don't have that property as well. So it's really good for us to use on ourselves as well as our actors. That's excellent. So what can we look out for in the future from Skin Saver? Well, what I'm really excited about is that uh, we've just figured out a way to put a uh, sunblock into the barrier lotion. So now 
it will protect against almost everything. And that's really exciting because we can use it for everyday wear, but we can also use it underneath regular makeup outside. It'll be a protection. And then we also are working on, we've created a line of all natural skin products, things for acne and and other skin conditions. And that's also going to be available. That company will be linked to our company and it'll be Skin Saver Beauty will be sort of our sister company with that. That's very cool. It sounds like an all-in-one for your actor, but also for the artist, which is amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Love that. So where can artists find your products? Well, right now we're available in the United States in Nigel's Beauty Emporium, Friends Beauty, Alcone in New York. In the UK, we're in London in a store called Pam and a place called Tilt. And then we can also be accessed online at skinsaverlotion.com. That's brilliant. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Today, I'm speaking with Rick Finlater, a hair and makeup designer based in Australia. He tells us tales of looking after Gandalf the Grey in Hobbiton, working on location in places like Antarctica, and what it takes to lead a happy and talented hair and makeup team. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Hey Rick, welcome to the Last Looks podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Hey, now I want you to finish this sentence for me, okay? (laughs) (laughs) he's like "Uh uh-oh um once upon a time there was a boy named rick and when he grew up he wanted to be um he wanted to be a makeup artist he did that's amazing yeah i think so i I think so (laughs) (laughs) so then you grow up and you go through high school and all that kind of stuff so what happens when you leave high school to make that happen I, high school, I kind of had an opportunity to be start a chef's apprenticeship mm-hmm. and I thought that was a great idea because it was really struggling just with some independence. And then during the course of the chef's apprenticeship, I realised that, you know, nobody wants to work while all your other mates are having a party, so that was a bad idea. And then um, an opportunity came up to go to makeup school during the day while I chefed at night, so I okay. just jumped on the bandwagon of that one and then before you knew it, Bingo. So you were going to school during the day and then working in the evenings? Yeah, I was literally, I'd go to school, I'd be at school by 8.30 in the morning and I'd finish at 3.30 and then I'd drive straight from um, makeup school straight to the restaurant and I'd work from like quarter to four till 1am. So I did that for a year. So it was a pretty big struggle to get finished and completed, but um, it was definitely worth it, although it it was hard. And the funniest thing was, I used to turn up at the kitchen covered in makeup and they'd look at me like, <laughs> what is going on with you? <laughs> yeah, like I, don't mean, having... I don't mean covered in makeup like I was in full makeup, lashes, lips and <laughs> blusher, but I'd have it all over my hands. It was like, it was just yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's a good thing you were young trying to get all that done in a day. Oh, my goodness, it would have been exhausting. Yeah, it was, but, you know, like you just said, when you're young, you kind of just jump in and go, oh, yeah, mm. no problem, away you go. And then, so once you did your training, what happened after that? Well, pretty much once I'd finished that, there was that fantastic, um, somebody made me aware, I think, it was in a nightclub one night that you could get this um, under-25 open work visa for Vancouver and coincidentally, this was right when LA was coming out of LA and going to Vancouver and making all their films. Mm-hmm. So I knew it was a, I knew it was a hot spot. And then um, I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to go and do this. So I just literally, me and a mate, he wasn't in the film industry. We just packed up, rocked there. I think I stayed at the YMCA for like two weeks. Yeah. Listening to Celine Dion on my CD player because that's how <laughs> long ago it was. <laughs> and uh, what was it called, a DVD man or something? Anyway, one of those portable CD players. Yeah. And then that was kind of it. And then I called every single TV station there was to do work. And then it just kind of this really lovely makeup and hair person called Fern Levin called me back after I called and said, do you want to help out with a commercial? It's unpaid. And I was mm-hmm. like, yeah. So that was that was it. And then little things started in from there. But 
I think I hung out in Vancouver for about two years. Yeah. And then I came back to Australia and um, that's when we just started back into TV and that sort of stuff. So when you were doing your makeup course, did you know that you wanted to do TV and film stuff or were you just kind of open at that point of I want to do makeup but I don't know where or how? No. Once I'd started, that was it. I just had tunnel vision. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. And, you know, I remember the teachers giving us all career, not opportunities, but different avenues that you could do once you were qualified. Yeah. And none of them other than TV or film interested me whatsoever. So, yeah. yeah. I think that makes it a little easier, right? Yeah, 100%. When you're just on that one track, you're like, I'm just going to concentrate on this and it's going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you did a bit of work in Vancouver for commercials and stuff like that? Yep, did a bit of that. Did a few days on X-Files and stuff like that. That's cool. And then... um. One day I came back and my Australian counterpart had just decided he'd had enough and left. Mm. So I was kind of stuck there. And then I think, I think it was just, my visa was just about to expire or something. And, you know, especially when you're young, you can only do so much time away from home. So yeah. I unpacked up and came back to sunny Gold Coast. And was there stuff being made there? On the Gold Coast? Yeah. Yeah. I think they were in the middle of, one of the first things I did was, just as a daily, was Street Fighter. This really does prove how old I am. <laughs> so Street Fighter the movie? Street Fighter the movie with Kylie Minogue. Oh, yes, I remember. Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, and of course I thought it was amazing. That was, at the time, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, so that, that kind of happened and then it just started and then I went into TV for a while, mm-hmm. you know, just like, Oh, one of my first things I ever did was Flipper. <laughs> that was good. Flipper is a TV show? Flipper is a TV series. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> did that one. And then I just started with, you know, those, the movie of the weeks, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. And you're doing both makeup and hair or just the makeup? Well, in Australia, that was, you had to do both makeup and hair. But at that stage, especially in just that episodic TV, the hair was really basic and I was mm. super green anyway. So it was just like, you know, it, it kind of worked for me to get my start getting my fingers into hair, basically. Yeah. Did they have any hair training at the course that you did, the makeup course? No, they offered a subsidiary one, which I ended up doing, but I didn't do it for a few years later after that. So right. that kind of okay. worked. But yeah, I never actually went into a salon, thank God. <laughs> No offence to all those people that have gone into salon. Sorry. Yeah, I won't take it personally. No, it's um, okay. <laughs> um, what are you going to fall back on, Rick? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that conversation normally goes. Um, uh, so doing all of that and then how long until you're heading over to New Zealand to crack into Lord of the Rings? All right. Because um, it looks like that kind of happened fast. Fast, yeah. Super fast. Yeah. I just get this phone call from Carol and Knott, who I had been on other shows with, and they were looking for a makeup artist to look after one particular character on Lord of the Rings. And so they kind of targeted me. Mm-hmm. And then it was a really dodgy decision to go because, you know, I had to read The Hobbit on the plane, so I didn't really know what I was going in for. And then, um, I'd sacrificed a year's work here in Australia, like a, a year in advance, yeah, to go and take this shot. And I remember getting there, and the production manager saying, "Well, you're on a you're on a three month trial." And I was like, you're "What? Like, what? <laughs> trial? Are you kidding?" <laughs> anyway, after that, I got caught up in the whole thing. But yeah, I kind of launched into that thing pretty quick. So reading The Hobbit on the way over having i'm assuming not having read lord of the rings trilogy books correct yeah wow so it's like a crash course into middle earth (laughs) i literally (laughs) dive bombed right into the middle earth (laughs) completely i belly flopped right into middle earth yeah okay so it's safe to say you were not a fan to start with um (laughs) you're like what is this all about I've got to learn what is going on. You yes. get there. And so is that before they had started shooting? No, I think they'd already started. They'd done some prelim stuff. They must have shot for about maybe it was eight weeks. Okay. And um, I, to this day, I kind of had no idea. And I remember being at a, um, a pre-party thing in this bar hmm. and one of the makeup artists walked up to me and said, who are you here doing? And I was like, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, what? And I'm like, yeah, why? And they're like, 
we've had over 300 applications for personal makeup artists to do him. And I was like, oh, really? I said, I didn't even apply. And then I kind of realised, well, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> forever hated. Yeah, forever hated. I was, there was yeah. a target on my back after that. Anyway. That's quite interesting. Oh, yeah. It was. I didn't realise. The point of that whole thing was I didn't realise how sought after a position on the team was. Yeah. And until they had said that. Once I'd said that, I kind of went, ooh, maybe I should take this a bit more seriously than I currently am. <laughs> yeah. I guess not coming from a background of being like, you know, growing up reading the books and all that type of thing, you probably wouldn't have any idea of the the just the size of what was going to be happening. Yeah. But, but you know what? Was, I don't think um, the guys there knew the size of what was going to be happening. No. Not until it kind of kicked in and started. And what is it now? It's like 22 years ago or something? 21 years? Uh, the first one came out in 2001. But you would have been sh- right. yeah, shooting well before then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember them putting like all out over the whole country, like auditions for background and stuff like that, for looking for certain types of people. And it was just like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and I grew up with, my dad was a big Tolkien fan and enjoyed reading Lord of the Rings. And every time I said, dad, I'm bored, he would like throw that book yeah. in front of me and be like, read this, go on an adventure. And I'd be like, what? No way. <laughs> <laughs> of course I eventually read them, but <laughs> I was just like, you're crazy. I'm not reading about wizards. And I know. Do you know what? I think I remember being on, on that, obviously on that film and um, looking after Gandalf and McKellen, but mm-hmm. there were just days that you'd be, you'd be so encapsulated within your little tomb of a makeup space. And three hours later or whatever it was to get his makeup and hair on, you'd open the door. Of course, it was dark when you went in and then it was light when you came out. But you'd open the door and I'd see these ring wraiths or, you know, a little flock of elves walking past <laughs> the trailer or, or, or another wizard just popping in to say hello. And I was like, oh, yeah, I love this shit. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I love how you just referred to elves as a flock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they were. They were always floating around doing something weird or playing with their hair. <laughs> That's so true. A flock of elves. That's yeah. awesome. That should be a band. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you were solely there for all three films looking after Gandalf? No. Well, I had um, established Ian as Gandalf the Grey mm-hmm. and then Gandalf the White. Mm-hmm. And then again, I think I got to my almost my must have been a year, year and a half mark. Yeah. And then a designer's job had come up back in Australia, mm-hmm. so I thought I either have to jump now, mm-hmm. as in jump and take the next step. Yeah. Or I, this opportunity might not present itself again. So you know, with great regret and sadness and all of that stuff, like we were great mates with everybody. So to cut a long story short, I ended up coming back to Australia, um, really missing the guys. But what was really nice was I was always invited back for all the pickups that happened on those films. So I kind of got to reconnect anyway. So I was really lucky. That was probably a big career choice for me because I was lucky to take a hiatus to pursue my career mm-hmm. from from that huge film and then still be greeted back to help complete the other two films that pick up, so the other three films that pick up. So, yeah, it was good. I was very grateful. That's awesome. And yeah. I, I guess it is a, that is a scary thing when another job pops up and you've already got that bird in your hand. <laughs> You're like, I've got yeah. work for however long if I stick with this one, but <laughs> that one might take me somewhere else. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's totally a case of sliding doors. That, yeah. You know, you go one way, it's going to happen. You go that way, something else going to happen. But so far, everything's worked out pretty well. <laughs> I think so. I think you're safe. Um, now, the question is, after you finished up all of that and those three films came out, did you ever think you'd be going back to Middle Earth? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you know what was good was kind of like because because I'd had that hiatus from Middle Earth, mm. I was like, did I ever think we'd go back to do it? No. And I think it was 12 years later that we went back. To do, was it 12 years? To do the Hobbit? It was something like that. So to go back and see everybody again, it was really quite strange. But it also felt like there hadn't been 12 years between films. That's for sure. It was just, just crazy. That is crazy. A few new faces. 
but I mean, definitely a few new faces. But yeah, I think it was the same recipe. Do you know what I mean? Like we were yeah. we were making a different cake. Yeah. But fundamentally, it was the same recipe. Now I'm assuming I I don't even know why I don't know this, but I'm assuming that <laughs> when you went back for the Hobbit films and yeah. looking after Ian again, you got a new beard and a new wig, right? Yes, we got. Okay. Because <laughs> I was like, did they pop that out of storage? And did you no, have to use that one again, no. or did you get new ones? Good question. But no, I got um, two new of everything. And here's okay. what's surprising that most people don't know because on Lord of the Rings, I remember being given two two grey wigs, mm. two grey beards, and they were to last me an entire year. Wow. And they did. So Good. it's always funny when people go, oh, this will never last. I'm like, mm, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. And then, well, did it need to last longer than that or no? On Lord of the Rings, no, that was kind of it. And I think there was a refront done on one of the wigs at one stage, but then on yeah. The Hobbit we were given another two and I think, yeah, I don't know. You always end up with your favourites though, don't you? You know, your favourite mm. wig and your favourite beard and the other one yeah. becomes a backup. So Yeah, you kind yeah. of yeah, thrash it. I think you just wear it in a little bit better than yeah. one wears in a little better than the other and you keep with it. Yeah. And how was that going back? To look after Gandalf again, like was it just like <laughs> well, he, he was really funny because I know um, I had it said it was a long time and I remember seeing him. We were shooting tests on something I can't remember on one of the one of the hobbits I think. Hmm. And um, so I saw him in the tent very quickly, hug, hug, kiss, kiss, hi, darling, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And then Peter Jackson came into the makeup room and said, "Oh, Ian's just been chatting, saying that." You, that you said that you don't need to put his nose on for the Hobbit, and I was like, <laughs> "I was like, good try, Peter. You need to go back and tell Ian I never said that, and he will be wearing his nose for the Hobbit." <laughs> <laughs> I remember Peter Jackson just laughing like crazy. <laughs> I love how he tried it on, though. Like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> see if this. I'm going to see if this plays through, and I can get away with not wearing the nose. That's yeah. hilarious. I have to say that it's not. It's not very often that I have like freak out little geek moments, but I. I will be honest that where when I saw Ian in his full get up, yep. with the hat on and everything, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just that first time and I think I saw him in the reflection of one of the mirrors and he just kind of walked through and I was just like oh, that was Gandalf <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you know it, it wasn't just you because I remember we were doing um we're shooting at Matter Matter in the North Island yep yeah so we're, at, we're at, actually at Hobbiton and the very mm-hmm. first day that Ian went on to set we were doing the scene where he drives up in the car horse and buggy thing and then gets out to see Frodo and we got out of the car and I can remember walking with Ian down the set and I could hear these people just go oh my god he's exactly like I imagined now that's not <laughs> to say I had anything to do with it I was just given the stuff and I stuck it all on yeah <laughs> but, but it was so nice to see people, you know, especially the fans of Tolkien go, oh, my God, there's Gandalf, like, for yeah. real. Just <laughs> yeah. recognise him and just be like, that's how I pictured him to look. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was very nice. Because it could just go, go the opposite way. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be a nice start to the shooting day, <laughs> hearing people no. go, what, he doesn't look right at all. That's oh, terrible. I, can you imagine that? That'd be pretty bad. When you were working on that first lot of films, I'm assuming had you done a lot of wig work and beard work and stuff before? God, no. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. So I was kind of, apart from what you do in, you know, makeup school, mm-hmm. but no, absolutely not. And you know what? I was so fortunate that um, my introduction to the world of wigs and beards and moustaches and, and prosthetics for, the, for that matter, mm. but... When you handed a Peter Owen wig and a Sarah Weatherburn beard, yeah. they really they make your job so much easier. Yeah. So and they were all handmade for Ian and everything else. But um, you know, that's not to say I still had to stay on top of it and keep the lace lines and I don't know, there's nothing worse than having a huge hat stuck on top of your wig. Yeah. And then a scarf stuck underneath your beard. <laughs> so it's just it's a lot of work and it just requires a lot of attention. All day, every day. There's no no downtime with that stuff. But um, when you handed those magnificent pieces made by those absolute geniuses, yeah, it's they really do make your life an intro the introduction to that life so much easier. Yeah, you're kind of spoiled straight away. Hundred hundred percent. 
was was Sarah there making stuff or was it was she in London it was being shipped over no initially she was in London man and it was shipped over but then she actually turned up for a little while yeah yeah and I mean you had Peter Owen there right we had Peter Owen there like right there so all the adjustments were done yeah it was just fantastic that's so awesome I wish I could kind of relive that because I thought that's how every film operated like do you know what I mean like yeah so I just kind of like oh this is nice this is pretty cozy you know and these amazing wig people and amazing designers and and then I realized oh I wish I could have gone back and just watched everything again in slow motion yeah does that make sense it does make sense because it, it yeah. I mean yeah you don't realize at the time yeah it's not that you've taken it for granted on purpose or anything it's just that it it happened and you were lucky enough to be in the middle of it yeah and i'm also going to say this too as like such a junior makeup and hair person i was mm. so lucky to be so supported yeah like that really makes a difference in the way you can um move forward with the rest of your career like they, those guys peter king peter owen the whole team they always made you feel completely supported they were always backing the makeup and hair department that you know yeah. it was a consolidated front and um i really appreciate that from those guys yeah, I um, have never met or worked with Peter Owen, but I do feel like that about Peter King and yourself. No, thanks, Dale. Always having that support and coming up in an environment like that is amazing. And then when you walk into another environment a few years down the track and you're like, what? Why am I behaving <laughs> like this? This is horrible. What is wrong with all of you people? You really um, miss miss your crew. <laughs> yeah. you do. Like, I- couldn't agree more yeah I know. it is a really nice uh, yeah it's a nice feeling to feel like everyone's got your back and if you can't you know if you can't quite get there that someone's going to just jump in and help you and yeah you know you're, just, you're gonna get it done as a team it's awesome that that is priceless but you know what it's kind of that thing where um once you learn how that healthy department can operate like that with complete support and having everybody's back i think that's a legacy that you try and pass down yeah when you start to head departments yeah or design departments you're like no no guys we can be friends do an amazing job and we can support each other yeah well i think you make that happen rick me yeah (laughs) yeah i like to have happy teams like i think i'm a firm believer in you do your best work Mm. when you're in a relaxed environment you're completely supported and you know what even as a designer now when i do design i just make the suggestion I hire good people and I get out of their way. Yeah. That's my motto. And the thing is that when you have a boss, leader, designer that does that, it makes you feel like you're trusted and that you are capable of doing the job Yeah, and you do just get on with it and you want to do it the best that you can because it's just like, oh, this has been left up to me. Yeah. i got to sort it out. It's my job now to yeah. run with this. And it, yeah, it's a really healthy way to work. I always wondered if you'd had like <laughs> previous training on supervising people or <laughs> like if you'd come from some kind of business background or because you're just so good with dealing with people. I mean, you know, you would have like, I don't know what, like four or five trailers full of hair and makeup people all working at once and it would just work so well. Yeah. Everyone would just get on and there was no bullshit going on. I mean, every now and again, you'd get a little bit of something, but it would never last. And yeah. it's such a good environment to be in. But it's just like that does trickle down from from the top. Yeah. Well, you put it, I think you said it perfectly when you said, you know, if your boss can make you feel supported, talented, appreciated, mm. then they're the big things that, you know, uh, you know, people will work harder to get the, the perfect result. And as the boss, I want you to do that. And I want yeah. you to go home and be happy every day. And I want you to come to work, wanting to come to work to do a great job. I don't want you coming to work hating me or, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But anyway, that's, thanks, Jill. <laughs> that's a nice thing to say. But I do like happy teams. I think happy teams are much more healthy for everybody and that you get a better result. Yeah. And it, I, I found, I think it was like the first time when I came on to The Hobbit that I feel like it was the first time that just being a full-time member on that and kind of being handed your characters <laughs> and it's just like there you go <laughs> you know you've got the you've got the gist of how 
you know, the design has been put in place and it's been okayed and you've got the tick and all that kind of stuff, but it's your job to read the script, your job to do your breakdown of your characters, your job yep. to sort yourself out. Like, come on, you're a yep. grown up now, get into it. And I remember that kind of terrifying me at first, but then once I figured out that, oh no, no, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Then I just kind of, yeah, ran with it. But at first I was just like, what? They're trusting me with this? <laughs> Are they crazy? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, no. uh, but I can't imagine you guys having to micromanage like 20 of us. Like that would drive you insane. <laughs> oh, you just could, I honestly, you couldn't do it. And I, I don't think, I've got no interest in doing it. Like I just, I've got no interest whatsoever in micromanaging anything. I just, it's just like, even though that might appear that I do, it's just, if I'm in the position of designer and I'm hiring, or even as a supervisor and I'm hiring, mm. I know that if I'm offering you that position, I trust that you can do the job. Yeah. So I really am just going to give you the guidelines and walk away. And then if I think something's going on screen that I don't think is quite right, we'll have a chat about it. But up until that stage, welcome to the team. Let's have a party. Yeah. No, I remember you... Um... <laughs> I don't even know when it was. When was it? When that kingdom, that film that never happened, that oh, we yeah. did like all that <laughs> prep and it never fell over. But the fact that I think you got hold of me and you were like, I want you to run run background. And I was like, oh, I haven't done that before. And you're like, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. And I was like, I can? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. But it's just that moment of having someone believe in you that it's just like, oh, they, okay, yeah. We can do this. As long as yeah. you're the boss guy and you're going to help me out, <laughs> we can get this done. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised how often it doesn't doesn't work that way. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> after after recent years, oh, yes, I wouldn't be that surprised. <laughs> you figured it out. <laughs> um, so when you are hiring a team of people, what are you looking for? You know what? The first thing I'm looking for is confidence mm. because even if you don't know how to do something, confident people will find a way to get it done. So I want confidence is number one, talent is number two, and I'm going to say that personality is going to be number three because it doesn't matter what anybody says, we work in a confined environment um, under stressful situations, sleep deprived, it just goes on and on and on. If you don't have the personality to work in that environment, be happy, cope with stress, own the work that you're doing at the time, have take pride in what is going onto the screen, knowing that, you know, potentially millions and millions of people might see it, mm. or just maybe a thousand people will see it. It doesn't matter. But as long as you think you're striving for perfection every single take on every single shot, then that's the person I want on my team. But you have to be a nice person to go with it because if you're not, then those other two get, even though they're the two that I want to, the two traits that I want to hire first, if the personality doesn't work, it's not going to work for me whatsoever. No, it's totally true. Yeah. It makes absolute sense. I was going to ask you too that while you were coming up, whether it was doing your training or in those first few jobs, was there any piece of advice that you were given that has really stuck with you? Um, in regards to managing crews or, in, or just no, anything? Just, just, I guess just career-wise, just working in the film industry. If someone above you kind of gave you... Oh. If I'm going to give you one word of advice, Sonny, it's going to be this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll tell you what. Peter Owen once came into the trailer and I was having a problem with, I was saying Ian's hair or his beard or Gandalf, you know. Hmm. And, and Peter turned around to me and said, do it like it is, not like what you think it looks like. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, if natural hair, let's say it's from the temple, right? Yeah. If the hair from the temple down to the ear is at a 45-degree angle, why mm -hmm. would you want to bend it at a 90 degree angle? It's going to look incorrect. So that whole thing stuck with me the whole time. Like if you are doing something that's supposed to look real, but it's fake, whether it's a prosthetic, a beard, a wig, yeah, you, you have to copy nature first and then you can put your own spin on it. So do it like it is, not like you think it looks like. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing ever that I ever learned. You know what? I was going to ask you what advice you give to others, but I feel like you actually said that to me at some point. Oh, my God. Because I remember, like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember, not maybe in those words, but I remember, especially with all the facial hair and stuff that we were doing on Hobbit, it was just like, 
and you were in the mirror and you're like, look at the direction that my hair grows on my face. Look at the, yeah. you know, and you were just, and I took that into all hairline growth patterns and yeah, yeah just like it's, it's you got to believe it. It's got to look real. Like look at the real thing yeah. and then make that wig, you know, go in that direction that hair grows down this way or over that way or whatever and that that has really stuck with me as well and I feel like I have also said that to other people so it's (laughs) it's being shared around yeah you know and I'm glad that kind of sticks that that's a legacy of Peter Owens that gets passed down because it is so true with hair patterns and I know with wig makers I mean as you know Jay I've got a Mm. shaved head so it's quite easy to see hair direction what's left Mm -hmm. on my head (laughs) So I quite have to get the wig makers and they're like, oh, do you want us to knot a, a part line in it? Do you want me to do this? I'm like, can you just feel the direction of the hair on my head? I'm like, I just need you to make the wig knotted like a human head. And then me as a stylist will push the mm-hmm. hair any way I want, but it has to match the hair on the head. So it, it, long answer to your story, that's the best piece of advice I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> and you do pass it on to others. So yeah, you get a better <laughs> result when you follow that technique. You know, yeah, but it's so I find it so amusing looking back at it that I hadn't thought of it. Well, that's that it didn't come natural and that everybody I've said it to, they've gone, oh, yeah. And it's just like you, you you think that, you know, you just think that naturally that you'd be, I don't know, that you would have thought of it. But it's just like, I think you get so wound up and like, it's a wig and I've got to do the wig or it's the beard and I've got to do the beard. And it's just yeah. like, you're, you're trying to manipulate it to, yeah. you know, it, uh, yeah. Something it's interesting. Not, yeah. yeah. It's just so interesting. The little, just those little subtle details and things that you can do to make it look more real yeah absolutely well i think um especially with peter holman he's like the genius of that kind of stuff you know i remember him going saying something about a prosthetic and he was like oh darling you just need more blood in that i'm like what (laughs) What are you talking about how can you get more blood in it it's like no you just need you need d32 and i was like which is a derma color yeah color but it's exactly the same you know pink flush the blood looks like underneath the skin mm. and I'm like okay I'll give it a try sure enough of course he's right but yeah. um it's just those subtle little things absolutely it's awesome yeah. so lucky to have these people above us to have given us oh my god yeah all these little tricks yeah, I still can't believe how green you were going into that whole situation. I, I'm sorry, I'm going back to it about that. You must have, oh, my goodness, you were learning on the job. That's amazing. <laughs> I really was learning on the job. One good thing that I can do is, like, I'm happy to just, I like to watch intently. And when you're being shown something, mm. don't worry about putting your own spin on it the first few times. Just do mm. it exactly the same. Like, yeah. even, if you, even if you have to video it and watch it again and again and again, do yeah. it exactly the same way you were shown. And then down yeah. the track, if you come up with something better or faster and you still get the same result, do it. But for the first few times, just copy the way they put it on. When you're being shown something, just copy it because that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And then um, and I still do it the same way now, though. I don't think there's a better way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. Don't worry. I've tried. I love it. <laughs> So um, throughout your career, you've worked on location quite a few times. Uh, You know what? It was funny because when we started this conversation about doing this podcast, I literally, Mm. I pulled up my IMDb page and I was like, Mm -hmm. I think the last count was like 22 countries. Some of them repeats. (laughs) Oh my god! But I've been overseas 22 times in the course of my work. For work. Wow. So within that, what was your favorite location oh my you know what you're like home I, <laughs> home is always the best location i love i love getting on that plane at the end of a job going see ya it's lovely bye see you next time um i don't think there's been any there's always something really gorgeous about one part or another and there's always something really ugly about one part or another but mm-hmm. i don't i mean new zealand how can you beat that for like I don't know how many days I used to stand on, in those mountain hilltops with all you guys and you just feel like, how beautiful is this country? Like, it is exceptional. It is so gorgeous. But mm. then you have bits like, you know, I love downtown Tokyo for its craziness and its manicness and its fashion and all that sort of stuff. 
Yeah. And then you can you can be on a sand dune in the middle of Namibia, like just admiring the sand. <laughs> yeah. Or well, just the insanity of that landscape. Like it's the crazy. insanity. Yeah. yeah. And then of course I did that, was lucky enough to do that job in the Antarctic. And um Oh, I know. It's amazing. So that, I think that when you're literally this big ship comes up and then the director says, We're gonna shoot over there, and I'm like what? Which bit of over there? They're like, that bit. I'm like, <laughs> but it's floating ice. He was like, yep, here we go. <laughs> so we get 20 were people. You guys, were you guys doing an ageing makeup on that film? That, that <laughs> film, I, I, I'll finish, let me finish this bit yeah, first. Go, anyway, go. so we get, we get 20 people on this piece of floating ice and the director says to his first AD, you need to get in the water. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> You guys have lost your mind. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm in this hazmat suit that I can, you know, if I fall in the water, it's supposed to give me two minutes of life before I die. I was like, oh, my God. Okay, I've had enough of <laughs> this. But I remember that film when it started. We started filming in Croatia. Hmm. Luckily enough, we started with the younger section of the cast members. So we had an actor in full wig, full beard. And, you know, sometimes the short beards can be much harder to deal with than the long beards. Yeah, I'd agree. So all of a sudden, the first scene, and I knew it was coming up. I just didn't know how brutal this film was going to be. We all get into the water, which was just chest deep, and it wasn't that warm. Where's this? This is in Croatia in a place called Havar. Oh, I love Croatia, yeah. That's beautiful. But we get in, and the next thing I know, I can see the actor pulling his goggles from because he was diving. Mm. So he pulls his scuba goggles up over the wig, and then he pulls his respirator down over the moustache and beard. And I just looked at one of Martin and just went, I think it's going to be a hard day. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here we are floating around with bottles of Talesis trying to get this beard. And we're wet, like completely wet, trying to get this beard stuck back down, the moustache back down. I'm like, I'll take the wig, you take the beard. And then they're supposed to kiss at the end of it. And at one stage, I think his moustache ended up on her. Oh and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> I need to be there for the edit of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. But so, just, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, that's just, that's rough. So you're going from Croatia and ending up, you're starting in Croatia and you, did you finish the film in Antarctica? No, we started in Paris. Okay. Then we, then we went to Croatia, back to Paris. Uh, we went to uh, Cape Town. We shot in Cape Town for a while. Oh, wow. Then we went down to the, uh, Argentina, then the Antarctic, which is yeah. which is amazing. Like I, seriously, it's if everybody gets a chance, they should go. Yeah. Quite beautiful. That was the Odyssey, right? Yeah. The film, and so the makeups that you were doing in Antarctica. Yeah. What what were you doing? Is it just like one person that you were looking after there or? No, we had three cast members there. Yeah. So we had, I can't remember his name now, which is terrible. Lambert Wilson was playing Jacques Cousteau. Mm-hmm. He was in full prosthetics and a wig. Then his, his eldest son in the film was in a full beard, a uh, couple of prosthetics, and then we had the female actress. She was in a wig and eye bag prosthetics as well. And it was really interesting to watch, like, what those prosthetics did within the cold. It wasn't too bad, but I do remember having Lombert in, again, in a diving suit because I don't know Jacques Cousteau was, like, the forerunner of underwater exploration. Mm. Mm. They were both in the water in Cape Town, so there were complicated things going on. There was these huge whales playing right next to us. We've got two actors in the water. The actor's getting really hot from all the exertion, which is making his face go red. But, of course, the appliances were staying the same colour. Mm-hmm. And, again, I'm screaming at him, trying to get him to make sure that he takes his goggles down, not yeah. up over oh. his wig, because there was no way I was getting in that water with those whales to tack that wig back on. <laughs> There's a lot of fear going on right now, and I'm scared, and I don't want to be going in the water. So you're going to have to sort yourself out. Thank there you very much. Huge, <laughs> huge, like literally these, we were just in those little dinghies and there were these oh my God. huge humpback whales. No. Like just coming up and down. And even the local South Africans are like, 
no, I don't think they're very happy we're here. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> I mean, what an incredible experience, but at the same time you're working, getting stressed out about what's happening to your actor and yeah. thinking, I don't want to get in the water with these incredible creatures because one may swallow me by accident. <laughs> yeah, I think you're more in danger of them having their um, their tail flop down on you. And believe oh me, God. when it comes out of the water and you're a metre from it, you don't want mm. that to happen. Mm-mm. That's massive. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. So you actually had more problems with the appliances and wigs and facial hair and stuff in the hotter kind of climates than the cold. Yeah. But I, well, mainly, you know, when they're in that situation that um, they're in the water and I can't really get in to do a color adjustment mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. Um, that was a problem. On land, it was always fine. But I, Dale, I always get the films where I've got some actress, you know, underwater being thrown around in a bloody tsunami or a, <laughs> somebody on an iceberg or it just goes on or somebody at the top of a mountain I can't get to. It's just like, what else? Somebody in Colombia? Like, I'm about to die getting swallowed in this muddy river trying to get down to do checks. I'm like, oh, my God. You're not the first person that's told me that Colombia is just like a, the surprise that they survived their shooting experience in Colombia. It sounds like a death trap with the because were you in the jungle? We were in the jungle. We were, funnily enough, we were <laughs> doing a film called Jungle. But, um, okay. <laughs> we Yeah, we were in some pretty remote areas. But I remember I, I'm not kidding when I say this, we had to shoot a section where a couple of the actors <clears throat> had been stuck in a river and they swim to shore and mm-hmm. they'd, had, they'd had too much rain so the river became literally like a, a mud sludgy kind of thing. Yeah. We, we had to shimmy down maybe five or six metres on bamboo poles with just those little crossbars with oh all the God. crap on there. And then with a warning that if you heard this whistle, you were to try and get out as quickly as possible because there was a whole, <laughs> there was a wall of mud headed our way. And I'm like, why did I say yes? 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 <laughs> You're the man for the job, Rick. <laughs> oh my God. He's willing to risk his life for his work. Yep. <laughs> oh no. It's insane. I mean, it just goes to show what craziness they ask everybody to do. Yeah, well, there was that time too. On, I mean, I could go on all day. Too. There was a time, actually, George, George was with me. It was a time on Mount Fuji where we were filming in the middle of winter and a mm. blizzard came through and they were trying to evacuate us all off the mountain. I remember being so cold, I went to the very basic catering and pinched their glad wrap. We had to wrap our feet in glad wrap and then put them back in our shoes just to try and heat the bloody things up. I've never been so cold. Does that work? Oh. I didn't know that was Yeah, the it really works. Give it a try. So they just turn into like little sweat, sweat socks. Yeah. yeah, it's not attractive at all afterwards, but it's okay during. Well, most location shoots, you're not feeling so attractive by the end of the day anyway. So <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's amazing. I love those stories. Now with doing supervising, so you've done a lot of supervising work and designing is yep. there one that you prefer? You know what? I think if I know the designer that I'm going to supervise for and I like the project that they're doing, mm-hmm. if I'm interested, I'm happy to go and do that. Uh, yeah. I'm, I would hope to think that I'm a kind of people person anyway, so I love that whole thing. Mm. Um, but at the same stage, I, you know, I like the designing aspect of it as well, so it's kind of I don't really mind. I tend to supervise a lot if I go overseas. Yeah. And then I usually design more local stuff, I think. I don't know. It's about 50-50 at this stage. That's cool. Yeah. What have, what have you been working on lately? Lately? Well, I finished Mrs. America with the lovely Anne Morgan and the lovely team over there. And, of course, she popped in for a little rescue moment. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I don't know if I was any help, but, yeah. <laughs> but yes, you were. <laughs> and then I've just been filming the latest Marvel action thing called shang chi and the ten ring so even though i can't tell you anything about it <laughs> no but that's cool so you're in the marvel family now i would say yeah well probably the yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. so that's obviously a comic book that they are making into live action yeah yeah, and yeah, yeah. shooting where are they shooting it in sydney or Sh- Gold Coast? yeah sydney sydney shooting it in sydney yeah australia's pretty How- busy right now 
That's good. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to ask you, is there a product or a tool that you would not want to work without? Ooh, a Denman brush. Mm -hmm. Definitely a Denman. My freestanding wig stand. Yeah. Cannot live without that thing ever. And this <laughs> product called the Panthenin, which I call baby butt cream, because it really is a nappy rash cream. I know it sounds weird, but it's got this antibiotic kind of quality to it. It's mm -hmm. soothing because it's got lanolin in it. And I just find if anything starts to, it's just a good rescue kind of cream for everything. <laughs> but if anything flares up on the skin, you just whack that on it. Yeah. But even if you look like you need to put a barrier over something or mm -hmm. um, even if you need it like in some kind of compound to like mix one of your makeups out with a little bit, mm -hmm. something to add a bit of shine. It's kind of my version that I like more so than Egyptian magic kind of thing. Okay. That's your go-to. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I do remember the first time seeing that on set and I was just like, isn't that for nappy rash? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally for nappy rash. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's a has multiple functions, really, for skin. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I would like to know who you would like to hear on the podcast, Rick. Thanks for asking, JL. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear from somebody that's been in their first year in the industry. <gasps> Yes. Just to find out how it was, what, what, you know, the ups, the downs, the tears, the happiness. I'd really love to find out what the first, what it's like now to be in the business for just the first year mm. or just, just the first whatever. I think all the big hair and makeup people are always fascinating with stories and stuff, but I would mm. love a junior, just a junior's perspective on things. Yeah, I spoke to um, Flora Moody the other week and she said the oh, yeah. same thing. I think because yeah. over in, in the UK they have juniors and trainees and like they have, you know, their system of moving moving up yeah. through yeah. the ranks. And, yeah, she wondered just even in the last five years how much it's changed in the UK especially because I think yeah. it's a lot busier over there now than when she was coming up. So. Do you have that in Australia, trainees and juniors um, and stuff? We have assistants, right? Well, we haven't, I don't usually have assistants only because I kind of, nobody ever treated me like an assistant, mm. you know what I mean? Like they'd always just give me the respect that they just gave me things to do and then just trusted that I could do them. So I kind of don't like the idea of assistants too much. I love the idea of a trainee. Yeah. You mean assistant in the in the way of like cleaning your brushes and tidying yeah. up and, but not actually yeah. doing any hair and makeup work? Yeah, I think if you're right. going to come under the team, then yeah. you should be doing hair and makeup from the yeah. from as soon as you get there. You need to be invested in it. Yeah. Yeah, like get in, get your feet wet, let's get going. So a trainee more? I think a trainee, like at the moment on the current film I'm doing, well, you know, we have these two trainees assigned by the government, which okay. is just fantastic. But you know that they don't have the experience that I can give them a cast member. Yeah. But they can get involved with background. They can see the procedures. They can help with cleaning up or stuff. But if I'm going to hire you on the main team, I'm going to expect you to be doing the stuff that everybody else is doing. Maybe not on, you know, the number one or the number two cast. But, yeah, that's yeah. my whole thing. That's awesome that you have that with the Australian government. You know, it's amazing. And they're really – everybody's excited about it. And it's just, yeah – really good schedule of work for them yeah it's a good support system for the yeah. well for the industry it's awesome yeah completely <laughs> well thanks for chatting rick it was awesome to finally hear your story because i'm <laughs> thinking that after what how, how long have we known each other like 15 years i don't think i knew half of that stuff so, oh well, that's good it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for coming on the podcast Anytime, JL, anytime. Lovely to chat to you. All right, darling. Bye. If you would like links to more of Rick's work, go to our Instagram at The Last Docs Podcast or the episode notes page on our website, www.thelastlookspodcast.com. The Last Looks Podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.